Good day to everyone, um, wherever you are joining us. Um, from my name is Anna Rue, and I'm a folklorist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I'm really happy and excited to be co-hosting um, this event today with FinFest, um, along with my fellow um, UW folklorist, Marcus Saderstrom. And uh, today's presentation um, will include some performances and readings by Diane Jarvie. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, this is a part of a year-long virtual FinFest USA series. Um, part of there's a music series that that we are helping to put together, and we welcome you heartily to this event. I want to open by thanking you uh, for being here today, and thanks to FinFest USA for organizing this fabulous series of events. Um, and also to the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures at UW-Madison and the Sustaining Scandinavian Folk Arts in the Upper Midwest Project. Um, some of you know us as Nordic Folklife as well. Um, I am a part of that project, as is Marcus Saderstrom. We're proud to be co-sponsoring this performance and other events in the music series throughout the year. We have... Um, Going on, we've got over 80 people here today so far um, supporting FinFest and the Finnish American Music Series, which is really exciting to see. Um, we'll be making some links available to you all um, so you can follow up for more um, uh, events in, in the FinFest series and the Sustaining Scandinavian Folk Arts in the Upper Midwest Project and the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Culture. This is a live program held on the Zoom platform, which means that the presenters can't, presenter, Diane, cannot see you or hear the audience, um, and you, the audience members, can't see or hear each other. We will have time for questions at the end, though, and you can use the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions, and we will share those questions with Diane towards the end of the program. We are recording this session today, and we will then share it through the FinFest website, as well as the YouTube channel for the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures at UW-Madison. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand the mic over to Marcus, and he will introduce um, Diane uh, Jarvie today and the way she told her story. Thanks, Anna. Uh... Thanks everyone for being here. My name is Marcus Cedarstrom. Like Anna said, I work at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison as a folklorist on the Sustaining Scandinavian Folk Arts in the Upper Midwest Project. Um, it's midsummer. We're celebrating midsummer, Johannes, so I hope everyone's uh, getting out. It's, it's a rainy day here, which seems fitting for what I know to be midsummer in the Nordic countries. Um, but I want to start uh, as I usually do when I welcome everyone to these these FinFest music series. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to kind of take a moment to think about place. So, like I said, I work at the University of Wisconsin Madison, which lies on Ho Chunk land, uh, and and I say that to acknowledge where we are and to acknowledge that we cannot tell the story of immigration, of history, of heritage, of family and friends, without understanding where we came from, where we are who came before us and who will remain after us. Uh, so take just a moment to think about the people who are in the place you currently live. Uh, think about those who are kin to you and those who aren't. Uh, those connections have helped shape who we are today and helped shape the places we live in today. Uh, so I ask that we all embrace that and reflect on that for just a moment uh, because these ideas of history and heritage and immigration and kinship are a part of what Diane Jarvie's music and poetry examine. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. So Diane Jarvie is an award-winning poet, a singer, a songwriter, and an all-around wonderful musician. Uh, she's a guitarist and a cantile player. She's performed folk and world music on both sides of the Atlantic. She's taught at universities, worked with public schools. She's a teaching artist for the Alzheimer's Poetry Project. She's recorded seven CDs, written five books of poetry, and has taken three songs from her CD, Bittersweet, and three poems from her book, The Way She Told Her Story, and created one short film with Cadence Nelson. Inspired by her mother's writing, uh, her essays, her poetry, her anthologies, Diane's music and poetry um, has recently been examining the history and heritage 
uh, through Finnish immigrant experiences, specifically those of women whose stories she amplifies as a way to help us all further understand the sometimes haunting nature of the heritage so many of us carry with us in our everyday lives. Just last week, I think it was, she released her latest album, This Ordinary Day, which she notes was recorded in the fall and winter of 2020, 2021 in her ordinary basement during a not so ordinary year. We're super excited to have Diane join us today to share some of her poetry, her music, and her research into Finnish immigrant women. So I'm gonna hand it over to Diane for, uh, for her to take it away. Well, <clears throat> hello everyone. Kitos to Anna, Anna, I'll call you Anna and Markus. <laughs> and Uva, Uva Nusta to all of you. I'm really honored to be here today. It's another way of being a part of Johannes in midsummer, I guess. Um, it's often a time for families together. And I feel like over this past very unusual year, Zoom has made all kinds of different kinds of families for all of us to come together and gather. So I'm grateful that I'm, we're all able to do that today. Um, and I live, I live near Minnehaha Creek in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which was first inhabited by the mound builders and then the Minnewakanton people. And so I thank you for saying that, Marcus. And I think that <clears throat> we always have to remember there are people who have come before us. And um, I find that's something I do come back to a lot in, um, in my work. You know, for someone who uh, really, I didn't embrace my heritage growing up. I really didn't even like Finnish music <laughs> very much at all. Um, I've subsequently been a part of like nine FinFests, uh, been to Finland six times, studied briefly at the Sibelius Academy, studied Finnish at the University of Minnesota. There are Finnish songs on six of my CDs, plus some inspiration of Finnish poets on my new one. Finnish related topics are in, on all of my books, except for one. So yes, my, um, my heritage is deeply threaded in uh, my tapestry as an artist. So I've found that I've been evolving over the years as a writer and a musician, um, that I've been drawn even more to the stories of my Finnish ancestors. And as I have been aging, and I think this is something that we all do as we move through the years, I think quite a bit about my parents and their experiences as well as children of Finnish immigrants. So while I was visiting Finland, quite a few years ago now, I stood on the land where my grandmother grew up and I saw the, by then there was just abandoned buildings and empty fields. And I thought, this is really sad. <laughs> and yet it sings. There was something there that, that was a haunting, but not necessarily in a negative way either. So I was there because I received a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board to kind of work on <clears throat> studying and focusing on uh, writing poetry, on the experiences of Finnish immigrant women and their female descendants. So I did some research of Finnish American writers, women writers and scholars, talked to a lot of friends and relatives to tell me they of their mother's stories, their grandmother's stories. They were always generous about that. And I did turn to the writings of my mother Eile Jarvampa, who's a poet, a uh, translator, and an editor. <clears throat> and she sort of inspired me, all of her writings, um, to begin this journey that I had been kind of skirting, but kind of always really interested in, into the voices and the words of Finnish women, immigrants, and their families. So I thought I'd start with a member of my own family, <clears throat> my great aunt Cecilia. And she was never shy. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Um, she was always working and always looking for ways to help others. And as a young girl, she came to Finland. I mean, she came from Finland, or actually came from Vipuri, which is a part of Kraly that isn't a part of Finland anymore, um, at age four. And when she came to Ellis Island, they put her and her mother in a cage. I mean, that's just kind of one of the things that happened to people. Her father was already here, but she learned English right away. So when new people came 
off the train to Winton, Minnesota, a little tiny place, she translated the new, you know, helped all the people coming in how to get where they wanted to go and what they needed as a very young girl. I would call her a late suffragist and an early feminist. Um, she was known to pass birth control on to women who were needing it. She came here um, in 1901. So this is a little while ago. She had, um, she was a journalist. She had her own radio show for years. Um, she was an actor who performed in the Finn Halls and that was a, in the worker halls. And that was a tradition around the United States for Finnish immigrants um, to have musical uh, presentations and lectures and lots of theater. And so she would go around the Finn Halls in this state as well as New York. Um, and she and her husband would translate Moliere and Shakespeare into finish so that they could perform these plays for their community. And so I thought I would <clears throat> read the, it's the title poem of the book. It's called The Way She Told Her Story. The way she told her story, she told them she was leaving for New York City, but your children, they said. Yes, she said, I know, I have children, and she got on the train. Men have children too, plenty of them were seated on the train. She had learned how to cross the earth and become someone else, but she knew the land circles back, and then who do you become? She had been like a stone thrown across continents. Still, she liked the train's voice, its score of wheels on switchbacks, the open windows half hum fingering her hair, what she liked best was how a voice could shape words, how those words sat on her tongue and came out firecrackers, sharp and hot, tossed from the stage to the dark shapes seated below. Everything was an old story and everybody always wanted to hear another, be it doves or ash, the world lit with candle power. Here is where she found a kind of home with velvet curtains and floors to sweep, a pile of scripts thick with ink and social observation. Artists muscling wit and props. Only here she could fashion a tale, take this stone and toss it out there herself and make it light and loose as a field of stars, passed from mouth to air, radiant, before it disappeared. So I thought I would sing this song that I think, well, was sung in the Finn Halls at the time. I'm sure Cecilia sang it. <laughs> Sounds like one of her songs. And um, when I was researching, I my one CD called Bittersweet kind of ended up being sort of at the same time as I was working on this book of poetry. And I found this, which was my mother's little red songbook in Finnish. And so I looked through it and I went, oh my gosh, look at these songs. <laughs> I know these songs. So, um, so I decided that I would record this song because I thought it was so important to IWW history as well as um, uh, the women <clears throat> of, uh, who, who, who were active in politically and socially. And so let's see if you can hear this. Oh, that's right. I'm just gonna scooch this this way. <clears throat> Anywhere. And I'm proud to fight for 
puukun sa alla sedan sykkir jorjelle maan valta luokkaan ja valta pikaan viikon elvosta niin olvoa kun naiset kentaistojen palha rintamahan saa she's a rebel girl rebel girl working class strength of this world from Maine to Georgia you'll see her fighting for you and for me yes she's there by your side courage and pride she's equal and you yeah. and I'm proud to fight for freedom with the rebel girl yes I'm proud to fight for freedom with the rebel girl So I was so thrilled to find that song and finish um, that I was very determined to record it. And I did. Uh, so, um, so I thought I would uh, read this poem. It, it's kind of about, you know, I think the 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 book in itself kind of covers, you know, how we we move through. Uh, Sort of loss of place, finding a new kind of place, you know, the whole immigrant experience. And I thought that in so many ways, the um, that um, I think like the immigrant experience today that's happening all over the world um, is uh, very similar to some of the experiences that the Finnish women had as well because I mean when you came in and Finnish women were always if they, they worked all kinds of different jobs and of course they were in the service class and they were often servants or maids or whatever and and that's where we start out and then they're trying to figure out like how do you assimilate and and um is this place what I thought it was and it usually is not <laughs> so so this poem is um is um uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it here. <clears throat> it's called Skylark on a Stone. She leaves the boarding house each day under gunmetal skies to walk basalt and lava flow, wet wings of the lake folding over her immigrant configuration. In the forest, her camouflage soul wavers and obscures. Sparrows sit on her lap, opening seeds. Fox run right over her shoes. She fell right in with those teams of circling skirts, shipboard and nestled too close. Loss and dream packed tight inside their carpet bags, the wet leaves of all those shawls soaking up damp and recent failure. Her clothes are now shiny in spots, the sharp angles of her body confounding stitches. There is a vagrancy in not belonging. She fumbles her new name like a fallen button. This land is not what she read in the letters. Her feet trip uncut paths, empty hands hold invisible maps with unwritten grids. Still, she is training her young heart to modest settlings. Slurry of yeast in a blue bowl, resurrection of black ink inside a book. When she looks into the forest, she thinks she sees her mother, arms heaped with lupins on Midsummer's Eve. She goes back down to the lake where each cold wave slowly wipes, slowly wipes away the old geography, the helpless telling of her distant story. Her bones becoming light, leaning and learning how to lean in, accept this new weight in this new wind. I thought I would talk a little bit about Viola Torpina since um, she's sort of, I feel like a mentor <laughs> for all Finnish uh, American women musicians. She, um, 
she was a second generation Finnish American actually. And um, she is probably the first uh, woman accordionist to record in the United States and certainly the first female accordion star in America. And um, she started uh, playing in the 1920s and was doing all as the upper Midwest circuit, but then eventually based herself out of New York and uh, toured wide, widely all over the US. And it was, it became a tradition for dancers to see her headlining her traveling shows, shows every summer all over the country. And my mother remembers her coming to the Finn Hall. She certainly come to all the Finn Halls. But what I love about Viola is that she didn't just um, play Finnish music. She was just a great purveyor of it, of course, and uh, a great uh, mentor to everybody regarding it. But she played all music. She's like the world music accordion player. She could just do anything. And, um, and she was beautiful. And, um, had a lovely personality. And uh, so I think she certainly inspired many, many people, you know, non Finnish people, definitely, as well as um, certainly all of us who are her followers. So I, this, this poem is, uh, is for her. I wrote it in kind of response. I certainly grew up in a home where uh, we had Viola Torpin and LPs and my parents would play them on more than one occasion. And I said earlier, I didn't really, <laughs> didn't really like that music that much then. But then I, of course I came to love it later. So, so there's this poem is called, um, there is a song I climb into. It is a dance, pell-mell gunshot, pogo stick polka, too many beers, never fear your dreams shottish. A what fate allows tango. It is a lake, all swell and skiff of holy rain. Drink for impossible thirst. Scuttle of flowers swimming at my ears. The dark purple deep suck of mud. It is a coin on a train track. The distant groan of freight. Downbeat of wheels. Bright face in the sun. Small clank under cars the judge transfer that lost story. It is an old idea, the unused language of home, the lost merit in forgetting, shadow tracery of absence, salty rind of a distant coast, birds murmuring through blue air, listen. Um, so this is a song that I learned from one of Viola's albums. It's called Mela e Potiatala. And it really is this um, I, such a kind of iconic immigrant song. And the lyrics, for those of you who don't know Finnish, and I just pretend to. <laughs> I grew up with it, but I don't know it as well. I'm sure you Finnish people know that I'm mispronouncing things. But the 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 translation is, we have no home here, just guests of whomever it may be. It is our fate to travel strange roads that do not leave, lead us home. Our loved ones live on a peaceful shore, the dearest land in the world, but we left to cross the ocean to a strange land far away. Ever 
So I think um, Viola sang or performed, played lots of gypsy songs in her repertoire. And I don't know if she ever, I don't think she ever did this one, but I, I really think it, she would have if she, um, it might have, this might have shown up before or I mean after her time actually. But it's a, it's a great gypsy song and it's in the woman, the woman power kind of gypsy song where she's kind of mad and she's fed up. It's like, <laughs> this woman's fed up. Um, she says, yesterday I got so mad. This is not a literal translation, by the way. <laughs> yesterday I got so mad, I turned purple. Um, how could I have fallen for an old man and his proposal? hitting on the music part here, but I, I think it's kind of important um, to talk about Katre Lammi. Um, she was a singer and an actor who came to, um, well, she was born in Finland in 1901, and she came and emigrated in 1920 and ended up in New York City. And there she met and married a fellow singer by the name of Ilka Lammi. And they were often seen in main roles in the workers' theater, the workers' um, hall in New York. And then they were among the Finnish Americans who went to Petroskoy um, in Russian Karelia. Karelia was, this part of Karelia was once part of Finland, but then was ceded to the Soviet Union after the war. So there was this Karelian fever, which was this recruitment of members of, um, the North American Finnish communities to go to the Karelian region of the Soviet Union to help build 
asked by society to implement you know, their ideals, basically. And um, <clears throat> so in, the, the recruitment took place between 1931 and 1934, and it lured, um, they were lured there kind of by the promise of jobs and better lives, and, but often only to meet tragic ends. So between 31 and 1936, the Lamis, they continued acting and performing in Karelia. But um, political opinions shifted a lot, certainly during Stalin's era. And um, her husband was targeted for not singing enough um, Russian songs or Karelian songs for that matter. And so he was arrested in 38 and shot. And then she was also arrested and put but her sentence was to um, was expulsion to Lime Island in Lake Onega. It was to mine the lime there, and so she was there. And it was made, that's where all the women went. So it was full of women and children. Um, <clears throat> but she was released at, eventually, and then um, just lived her life in uh, Russia and Karelia. So she never got to go back to the U.S. or to Finland, for that matter. But she there's this great story about her when they she had to go on the boat with all the other women. She kind of stood at the bow or as it was pushing away and she sang, you know, very defiantly this Finnish song. <laughs> you know, you think you have power, but I, you know. So, um, so she's really an inspirational uh, story and a very sad, tragic story that happened to a lot of people actually during that time. So we always want to, uh, I always want to honor and think of those men and women who had to go through that. and. This next song is a song that I actually learned from my mother, and it was also heard in the workers' halls and the Finn halls. Um, and she translated into, my mother translated into English, and so I learned it from her, and it's called Rata Jan Serenadi, or Toiler's Serenade. I remember still that sound so clear That I heard so often as a child it was not the wind sighing through the trees. It was mother's cradle song to me. To land, to do, to do, the child now go to sleep. Sing out my mother's voice so dear to me. Though to bondage you have been born, my child, read on well. Promise come someday. I remember father's tales he told as I sat at night upon his knee. Of the harshness of the world he told, he would sing his songs at night to me. Tulando, do the little child be on your guard. Sing out my father's voice so dear to me. You are marked, my child, as a slave to toil, and a tiny crumb will be your pay. I remember still my mother's songs. And the evening tales my father told. Singing through life's storms, I must now go on, toiling at heavy work each day. Tulando, do the lula freedom from our chains. Sing out to me, all voices of rich slaves. The world belongs to those who work, not to those who exploit the press. Tulando, do the lula lasta no coman soy mola ni arman ay tini baika oriax sinit. Freedom will, I promise, come someday.
are you be able to can you guys hear me is that still working okay and how are we doing on time <laughs> so i thought um you know these women that came here did you know there were midwives and they ran boarding houses they were um they just did whatever they could to make a living and um thank you <laughs> thanks for that i'm glad you can hear it um, so I thought I'd, I'd read this this poem. It's called When She Filled the Bowl, because this was another kind of work that Finnish immigrant women had. Um, <clears throat> when She Filled the Bowl. We were brought together in the middle of that dense map of trees where galaxies of mosquitoes spun around your ears, chinks of sunlight squeezed through pine needles. There was a woodbine confusion on all the paths at night. If you didn't follow the buzz and gasp of stars, you could be lost for good. If you, <clears throat> excuse me, I lay in my bed alone, raw wind scouring away every silence. I dreamed a deep green sea, men sloshing up on shore, pulling their seaweed beards, holding empty plates. I couldn't believe the money. When you haven't got any and it is given it seems you are walking inside golden halos. All words spoken are soft and round. Hunger becomes a distant corner of dust far from anything in your life, but not really that far. The lumber camp mess hall smelled of sweat and bread dough, the famished forever digging in their bowls. Great mounds of men appeared and disappeared all through the day, their large slabs of hands waited in turn before the river of milk, pancakes stacked like cordwood, scooping oatmeal to their chapped boy lips, soups and stews to ride the dark, cold nothing of their bellies. I learned how to sandwich mercy and power between thick slices of bread. And when every scar of your life pulses with failing, sugar and butter shine brighter than any old world sun. I was the only woman in this home of ax men. Nobody bothered me. The future was already written. Money was the only word of love. So I thought there's this, um, my mother had a cousin, um, Hilma, who came to Finland in 19, I mean, from Finland uh, to New York City in 1920 and got a job as a maid and, um, I remember my mother telling me this story, like uh, I think it was the '50s when you know she had seen her periodically, but she said, "Oh, you know, my lady isn't home." <laughs> but my family, my parents were visiting with my brothers, and we, you can come now to where I live. And so she showed them, and they were in the New York City Blue Book. I think these were fairly well-off people, and so she toured the place a little bit and then she said opened the door and said and here is where i this is my room and my mother was shocked because you know it was literally like a nun cell like it's just some tiny little room with one tiny little bit and that was kind of it i mean maybe she had a little place to put her clothes but it was a very limited experience and she had done this for years i mean she just stayed there forever decades and um so um, so this is a poem kind of dedicated to her and all the other maids that are doing this kind of work today and all over the world for us. And um, it has a little epigraph in Finnish, Minua e ole oriaksi luotu, I was not born to be a slave. Secrets live in small rooms. Perhaps this morning will be different, but she knows it is the same as always. There is her immigrant past that finds its level every day, sometimes a storm, sometimes shock, sometimes as distant as a story in a thin newspaper where you nod your head in faint recognition. There is her work, which in simple truth is boiling, scrubbing, folding people's lives into clean, sharp corners that poke at others who are soft or have sharper corners still. It is work for those with what is called wealth, who like to wallpaper their lives with a shimmering indifference. It is in a home where receive is the common language of the day, 
and the elegant interlocking of need and want cross-stitch endless demands. This is the place where she had learned fatigue can be a pure kind of grieving. Sometimes when the pigeons start their wing scrapes at her window and the whole smoky city is still asleep, she sits up in her little maid bed, studies the four corners of her room she has lived in many years, tucked down the hall from those she serves and, invent, and invents for herself a different future, a private life, a home with her children, digging in her garden, stirring spoons in her own pots, speaking of dreams with her forbidden husband that involve her own heart each and every day of the week instead of only on her one day off. So she was, she did have a husband, but that was forbidden. So they were married for years, but it was a secret. And he was a chauffeur, for, he was from France and he was a chauffeur for other wealthy people. And none of these people could ever get married. I mean, they could not admit it. So um, that was a secret that they had for years, um, but they did have that one day off a week. And I guess sometimes it lined up so they could be, to, be together then, but that was kind of it. So, um, so those, you know, that's certainly happening now, maybe not the marriage, well, I don't know about the marriage part and in, in different parts of the world, it's just, you know, the underclass that serve and experience different kinds of lives than the rest of us, of course. So, um, let's see. Do I have time? How am I on time? You're doing, I'm you're doing great on time. Yeah. 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 Um, can I, I actually want to yeah, ask questions? Jump to, in. To jump in. There, there's, a, there's a few uh, questions that I think are really relevant right okay. now. Um, both, uh, two of them, two of them related to your aunt. Uh, and they were asking for, for your, uh, her name. Um, and uh, Dr. Jim Leary asks, um, was uh, Cecilia Koitinen uh, your great aunt, Cecilia, um, because she made a bunch of recordings for the Library of Congress in 1937? Yes. So Cecilia Koitinen was my great aunt. And yes, she did. She was one of the people that was recorded by Alan Lomax or the, the team of Alan Lomax that came through to the upper Midwest to record, which is such a great book. Can we plug the Jim Leary book? <laughs> It's such a, you know, that's an amazing document, which is right here. You know what? I'm sorry, Jim. It's like folk songs of the upper Midwest. Is that what it's called? Of the upper Midwest. Um, but yeah, and she appears in there. And, and it was such a, a surprise because I got this book and there was my, <laughs> there she was. But yes, she, Cecilia Quidunen. Um, I'm happy to have her as a relative. <laughs> And you know you've been you've been talking a lot about um, uh, women doing some of the things that we don't necessarily hear about, right? Uh, women in the labor movement, women um, working in these different uh, industries, um, women as as activists, which of course was a huge part of of any immigrant story, um, but maybe not one we always hear. Uh, but we've got a question here that's kind of related to that. Um, uh, and someone writes, my mom grew up in a very Finnish Lutheran household in the UP. She wasn't allowed to dance or play music. Um, so the music that we're talking about, the music that we're hearing, the music that you're singing uh, was, was not necessarily uh, something that all Finnish immigrants were, were dealing with. You've got kind of, you know, church Finns who, who maybe weren't listening to this. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And I'm not the utmost expert at this because of course I knew there were the the either the white fins and the red fins or the church fins and the you know the co-op fins and so I was you know my both sides of my family tended to be on the the, the they weren't the church fins but I know I've sub subsequently worked in the you know the community of Kokato Minnesota which is you know a lot of church fins and, and other fins as well and yeah I mean that's a different experience they had growing up for sure um where no, they didn't. They, they, their, their dancing was not permitted, and the music that was there were, were, were hymns, of course, and a wonderful, wonderful tradition of Finnish hymns, definitely, but not what you're hearing today, for sure. It's a different, 
a different uh, ethnic experience for them. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got a couple more questions, but we'll we'll uh, okay. we'll work those in as yeah. we go along. Yeah, so but... here I'm going to circle back to <laughs> another woman that I'm very um, enamored with. Um, it's a uh, her name was Helmi Madsen, and I learned about her through my mother, who did quite a bit of translating of her poetry and her um, short stories or plays, actually. So tell me, tell me, um, she was born in 1890 in Finland and came over in the US, or I think she was in Canada for a while and then ended up in the US in, in uh, America in 1911. And she was an activist in the Finnish American society. She was a writer and a commentator. Um, she was the editor of the leftist women's newspaper Tovreitar for 10 years and then wrote for the newspaper Etenvang. She also wrote 500 poems, published five novels, uh, serialized seven other works of fiction in addition to writing full-length plays. So she was like this amazingly prolific person and you know and never was never tiring. I mean, she just worked all the time. So, so incredibly inspirational and always, you know, progressive forward and women forward, you know, for everything. And so um, I'm very enamored with Helmi <laughs> in so many ways, but this is a poem for her. Um, and it's also dedicated to all the women in journalism you know, and particularly immigrant women in journalism, because now we're hearing about them more and more too. And that's, as, as you said, Marcus, this is what happens when immigrants come. I mean, we also hear their voices. Maybe they're not making money in the same way and they're econo socioeconomically, they're different, but then they're very active uh, and we hear their voices in different ways. So this is a poem called Mother Inc. and it's for Helmi Madsen. I take the black heap nothing of letters, blend story and map, reflect worry and shadow, align words into linear columns, cast off from hot metal tattoos. Pulled from the weight of dream and despair, I am given speech from the lips and tongues of others and make a kind of imperfect song. And I am an imperfect mother that sets a table where the underclass of the world claim their chairs and tell their stories. There is always a code and an index strewn through my day and the need to edit proliferates. I could say I ask for nothing but some kind of truth, a common language that answers the watchfulness and hunger in all of our voices. But instead I rely on a linear metamorphosis a kindled story to winding sheets, a wild twist of fortitude slamming like fists onto crisp folds of a printed pulp. So in my most recent um, CD that just came out, it was all about um, me. It's just basement tapes. I'm just sitting in the basement. I lost all my work. It was the pandemic and I had been nudged by my my daughter to maybe she should make another CD or something. And so I had a dear friend who gave me the equipment. It's just kind of live capture recordings really. And um, it was really a great experience for me. I have to say, I, I just loved all of it. And it's just singer songwriter stuff. It's all in English. I've never done that before. Um, but I was so taken with a poem by Helmi called I am old and young. And so she inspired this next song that starts, that's the first song on my new CD. Um, and I think about it because um, of my work with uh, seniors. I do a lot of uh, some poetry classes and creative writing classes with seniors and assisted living and also with the Alzheimer's Poetry Project. And I really miss them because all of that work, of course, much of it went away for, for a, quite a while, but I was able to do some later which was so amazing because, you know, the, 
that's kind of an invisible population in this country. We don't like the, the elderly or the elders or our seniors, and these are our wise people. And I, I'm always sort of hurt by that. And I was raised in a culture, you know, in my home and um, maybe just, you know, my heritage that you should, you know, revere the wise people in our culture. And so, um, so this is really her words that I've kind of messed with some and they're, they, her words are actually in this song um, in the first beginning of each kind of verse there. But also I noticed actually, I was looking at the poem again. I went, wow, I kind of, I did knit some things in there that were also hers throughout. So it's called, I'm a volcano. I don't know if there are any other <laughs> questions at all. I just want to say um, that um, during the pandemic, I was thinking a lot of my grandmother, um, who we lost to the last pandemic. Um, so she left behind her husband and four children. It was a second wave of the last pandemic. <laughs> And the youngest being my father who was just turning three. Um, and so during this past year, I feel like, and all I kept thinking was what was that like and what we were experiencing this last year. And, um, and I do feel like um, we're making some of these new connections with each other that arc across the world as a result now. And I feel that there's much to take away from this global experience of loss. Um, and I hope we have more capacity to open ourselves to new ways to communicate and to kindness, to help each other, to make art, and for all of us to sing. Um, so I just, uh, I'm a, thank you guys for letting me be a part of this. Um, I know we have some, maybe, I don't know if anyone's asking. <laughs> questions, but I just wanted to say that because I think um, 
you know, things are opening up now, but it's not over and it's not over in the world. And um, I just kind of want to for us all to remember that too and that we're all kind of in this together if we can and let's sing that's one thing we can do i mean i think with that we're all in this together there's actually a really great question here uh that, that speaks to that to some extent um someone mentions that there was a film made about uh farm women that um kind of helped hold hold finland together as the men went to war um and they're wondering then if you've done any songs, written any songs, written any poetry uh, about the immigrant Finnish women who, who worked the farm as their men worked, uh, you know, the grain harvest in the West or the mines and the forests um, and that kind of itinerant labor that was uh, really common for a lot of Finnish, Finnish men uh, who came to this country. Yeah, I have not. And so now I have a great idea. <laughs> moving forward thank you for that because i think that i mean i missed all kinds of things I, I i have a list going and it will be added to that list of um all the different ways that we forget all those experiences of people that come here and particularly and obviously i'm speaking about Finns, but um yeah i think that's a those women worked so hard and um in the field i know that they did and that's something I do want to address in the future. Um, we've also got a question specifically about uh, one of your poems in uh, which collection. So I was not born a slave. Um, is that in your most recent collection? Yeah, the way she told her story. All right, I will. I'll put a, a link to that in the chat okay. then. Um, so, so one of the things that I've, I've really appreciated about this is um, just all the the many strands that that come together. I think uh, when we look at immigration and uh, the experience of women and the labor movement and work and uh, kind of invisible work, the work that happens at home um, that maybe isn't uh, always recognized in, in the way it should be. Uh, so I really appreciate that coming together because I think it's a lot of things that we've, as you mentioned, been faced with, dealing with during this pandemic. Uh, and the very real experience of, of uh, longing and loss uh, and, and searching for something as we're all in a very different situation uh, than, than um, we've maybe been in before. And, and your latest CD, uh, I love that you say, you know, it was made in your ordinary basement during a very not ordinary time, but you bring in this Finnish inspiration, despite there being this, I think you said it was your first CD without any Finnish uh, on it. But this Finnish inspiration that still comes through is really fascinating to me um, because you're bringing in the words from Finnish to, to English, and there's sort of a rematriation, I suppose, in a sense, right? And we and we saw that with with your with the the Little Red Songbook that you pulled out. Um, you know, Joe Hill only wrote in Swedish, uh, or excuse me, only wrote in English, but he was he was Swedish, uh, and so you get this kind of repatriation through translation to Nordic immigrants. Um, so I wonder if you could kind of. Uh, talk a little bit about your experiences with translation and, and Finnish language as a way to uh, connect to your, your Finnish heritage through um, poetry and music. Yeah, you know, it's, I think when you are a third generation Finnish American, um, we, I mean, I, I'm being very general here and including people I probably shouldn't. But I think we have a lot of um, feelings of betrayal <laughs> and loss because the language is not passed down to us. And there are really good reasons. It's not unusual for second generation, anybody to not pass that la their language on to anyone. But I think there's a, a poem in my book called Dear Carl and um, 
it talks a little bit about, you know, my parents growing up in Finn Halls or my mother and then my dad and got a job in Washington, D.C. And he worked for, they were in Washington, D.C. before he went off to war and he worked in the Justice Department. He was a file clerk. And when he was looking through the file, he just saw all these, you know, he grew up in Embarrass, Minnesota, you know, so he found all these names of all these farmers, you know, who obviously were very, very scary people to the FBI at that time, you know, because they were cast in that shadow of, oh, he must be a communist and that's all evil because it was, you know, ramping up to the McCarthy era. And so then the McCarthy era came after the war. And I think a lot of Finns who were grew up in that particular, not the church fins, but the other fins went, whoa, you know, this isn't really something we can share. Not that they were, you know, they were all like, my parents went to church and, you know, they were nice suburban people. And, you know, because they were trying to, there was like weird assimilation that had to go on for their parents. And then another strange assimilation for them to sort of repudiate <laughs> what, how they grew up which was loss for them. So there's this sort of um, this continuation of longing and loss and belonging and not knowing. So for then, so they weren't going to go around unless I had a grandparent, which is how third generation, later generations often knew the language. There was a grandparent. I didn't have that near me at all. I would have learned more, but they really did not want to teach me. I mean, and that wasn't unusual either. So it's been a really hard thing to reckon with because it's so part of my DNA and my identity and I don't have the language. It's not a one you pick up really easily. <laughs> Sorry, Finnish folks. This is a hard language. <laughs> and I've certainly, you know, been to Finland. I've certainly studied Finnish. I tried to sing it. I mean, my attempts I'm sure are lacking, but it is, it's so tied to the culture and how important it is that I carry that loss as well. And so I think that's what brought me to wanting to sing in it. And I started singing in high school. I don't know. I was in my bedroom. Oh, I like this song. And, and then, you know, then started playing cantares and, and I just sort of embraced this thing because I didn't have the words and I couldn't communicate with my relatives. We go up north and it was like we were in Finland. Everybody spoke. I was the only one, the only kid and no one else spoke English. I mean, they my, the younger generation, obviously the second generations, but none of the third generation or first uh, immigrants weren't really speaking English that much there. So I think it brought me to, I never knew my grandmothers. And this is what I always say. I started singing Finnish to talk to my grandmothers. And because um, that was some way to communicate and honor them and uh, be witness and continue uh, some sort of lineage in the only way I could figure out how to do it, which is incomplete, but then it always is. There's this great quote, um, Yoni, Yoni Inkola is a great Finnish poet. I think I have it here somewhere. Um, and he has this great poem and it's, he says, every, it's called genealogy, his poem. And he says, everything in me is a contagious debt and my heart has nothing to pay it with since the echoes of its pulse cannot go backwards. And that's what I kept finding out when I was in Finland or I've been doing this stuff forever. I can't go backwards. I mean, I went and walked all those lands and visited, you know, all the, um, went through all of my genealogy, the pilgrimage of going to all the different places my relatives lived. But in the end, you know, that that's about as far as you can get. And so you learn that it's still going to be kind of an emptiness, but so full in your heart, nonetheless. So it's really a dichotomy in a way, and you carry it with you and you carry it forward. And I guess it's always this, if I feel haunted, it's because, you know, I still am so moved by so many aspects of my Finnish heritage that it will always be a part of me and I'll always be doing it. And if I, I attempt it with the language, I attempt it in translation, I want to keep it going. And I, and I thought, you know, I kind of like slid it <laughs> into this CD because, you know, I don't have to, I mean, I can say lyrics by Helmi Madsen, um, 
whoever that would be to anybody else. But I just thought, no, this this stands as another part of my um, my ancestry. So it's all it's all approximation, you know. So we can do. That's yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, uh, you said at the very beginning, you mentioned haunting and said, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing, right? And, and what you just described is is a sort of haunting that that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's something you carry with you and yeah, and makes you who you are. That's wonderful. Um, we've got a question uh, here. Uh, um, are you familiar with uh, some of the songs of um, that that Marjorie Edgar collected in songs from Metzola? Um, yes. Excellent. Yeah, yes, yeah. and a wonderful book, you know, that Joyce Hakala also put together. And so that's just another amazing document to keep alive all of, you know, that part of the heritage too. Um, so we're always grateful for any of anybody who goes to the trouble of, you know, I mean, here, here Marjorie had done all that work and then who, who was she? And so then, then Joyce came and said, no, this is somebody who's <laughs> another important woman, you know, one woman looking at another important woman to keep that part of the heritage within this country going. So it's a, it's an amazing document. It's a great book and has great, you know, selection of material in it. We've got. Oh, go ahead, Marcus. I was just gonna say we've got, we've got one uh, another question here um, about kind of uh, making connections to what's been what's been going on uh, recently, uh, and someone asked, you know, what is what is this Finnish Finnish American protest tradition that you've spoken to the you know uh, tradition of activism and protest? What can that offer us today in terms of, of social issues that we're all grappling with? Well, it's all the same stuff, really. I mean, my grandfather was uh, worked in the co-ops, so it was all about, and the, and then he was in the IWW as well, um, which means you know, workers' rights, women's rights, uh, racial equality, equity, women's rights. I mean, it's it's you know what's going on now. It was these were all issues at that time that they were working really hard for they weren't always appreciated for it just like i don't know we're ever appreciated for it um because we were kind of you know the later um incoming immigrants at that at that time of like the first decade of the 1900s and so you know if you were a church fan i'm sure you kind of slid in a little easier but i think it was at times a little more of a challenge if you were saying, you know, this is wrong, <laughs> and I, you know, my grandfather came here to avoid conscription in the Tsar's army. So right away, you know, he's coming in here and, and he's involved in the co-op and my grandmother was as well. Because um, you want everyone to, you know, there are food deserts, right? And so why do we have food deserts? And why don't we have cooperative? Why isn't the food for everybody? And why isn't there education for everyone? In the Finn halls, the tradition was, you could come and get a meal if you didn't have food. You could, there was a library, so you had free access to books. Um, you could come and have, you know, discussions about whatever. I mean, it's like, it's all about, it was about community. And of course, then there was the performances and the music and the theater and, and all of that. And I think there was medical aspects to it too. So again, I mean, you, you hit on all those you hit those buttons and it's all the stuff that we're still you know dealing with in different ways now so you know and they in many ways those halls and the co-ops were really successful models but you know are those halls you know most of them of course are gone and the co-ops that they you know maybe there's some that have lived on you know and there are some certainly the cooperative movement is still going but i think some of those you know, history repeats itself, obviously, and we're all still learning and, and finding our way through and trying to be inclusive. And I think, you know, that's the goal. And I think that that was their goal. How successful, you know, they were, you know, I can't say I wasn't there, but 
I know about some of it and I know about the stuff in my family. And I mean, I, I think that we're just all, again, we're all in this together and there are so many ways, so many models that we can keep trying to um, enact and include people. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, and, and to bring it back to your music, of course, and, and you know, a song like Rebel Girl, I think uh, Joe Hill at one point said something along the lines that, you know, once you teach someone a song, no one can take that from you. Um, they can, you can burn books, you can, you know, burn down Finn Halls, but you can't take someone's song, you can't take their music. Um, and so, the the songs that you've sung for us today the poetry that you've read for us today i think really speaks to to that aspect as well so it's really really beautiful oh, thank um, you. i just wanted to share this comment we have uh dr dr allen in notes here um you were so eloquent in commenting on your back background you definitely inherited your parents um a uh, sense of tradition community and family and he remembers them um both so well so i thought that was a really wonderful thing that was Nice to Thank share you, with Arnie. everyone. <laughs> yeah, I miss them every day. They were amazing, <clears throat> amazing parents. I was I was lucky that way, and they embraced. But they had shunned it kind of, and then they I watched them embrace it. Their heritage. When I was the funny thing about this, the reason I am here, probably was because of you, Hanus. When I was maybe fourteen or fifteen, there was a big celebration, and I never, you know, I thought, oh, I have to go to a finish thing with my parents, and, uh, and it was this beaut, it's somebody's beautiful backyard, and then all the women had their costumes on and flowers in their hair, and there were big bowls of strawberries, and there was live music, and I just thought it was like a dream, like it was it was cinematic, and right away then I went, okay. This finished thing is a lot different and deeper than I thought it was. And it has joy and beauty in it that I wasn't aware of. And that turned me, I have to say. So, um, and my parents embraced their full speed ahead, you know, it went from zero to 60. It was always there for them, but they were very, became very active in the Finnish community in their 50s and onward. I think it's a it's really interesting to think about when we as immigrants or children of immigrants or grandchildren of immigrants how and and when we embrace um, our heritage uh, and or 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 sometimes reject it right uh, but the the language thing keeps popping up in the chat here so it was really wonderful to hear you speak uh, speak to that um, as someone mentioned that for them. Finnish is, is the language of love because Finnish was the language that their parents spoke and their grandparents spoke. And, and even though you didn't necessarily get it with you, it, it triggers all those emotions, which is a really wonderful way of, of thinking about that type of haunting, right? Um, yeah, and that's, that's a beautiful, I mean, love is the beautiful kind of haunting, isn't it? So, and I agree with that. I've certainly, I have tapes of my mother reading um, her po at her poetry readings and there it's, you know the and she's reading obviously her own work in english but also in finnish and it's you know it just kind of goes right to the solar plexus it's something that we can't describe and that's what art is it's indescribable and how it affects us and it's kind of a visceral kind of experience and i find that also as that person mentioned about um the language and and how powerful it can be in, in a very beautiful way Diane, I had a, I have a sort of a question that's still forming in my mind, but a number of, a number of um, elements of your, um, of your songs and your, your poems and your reflections have, um, have struck me as, as uh, creating these, the links through, through haunting from the past, using the past to kind of shape the future. And you've um, you've invoked the the memory of Viola Turpinen and Katri Lami and and uh, these women who've helped shape your work. I'm wondering, and you referred to uh, to mentorship. I'm wondering if you could um, talk about the different mentors that you've um, that you've drawn from um, through your career and 
and um, and uh, maybe reflect about a little bit about how your work, your body of work is is creating um, something for the future um, beyond beyond us. Well, I don't know if I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm just doing what artists or writers or musicians do. We're just doing the work. Um, I think I've had lots of uh, mentors along the way. I mean, I, I mean, my mother was a huge mentor just because, you know, I think she spent, she was like a high school teacher <clears throat> and then just worked all kinds of different jobs and kept secret this poetic life. So she wrote on grocery slips and then hid them in her, drawers of her vanity and no one knew that and then suddenly when she's like in her mid 50s and this the loft literary um center opened up in minneapolis she said well i'm just going to go take a class and then from then on i got to watch this growth and sort of fluorescence of an artist i mean she just sort of went okay this is what i <laughs> i am now and when I was like, a, you know, in junior high or whatever, and I, and so it was like, I started reading all the books that she had, you know, because she was in classes all the time. And, and then she started like her first book of poetry was published when she was 60. So here was somebody who was a role modeling that you don't have to be a certain age to do something in the arts or to do anything really. And that's an incredible gift. And then to watch someone have this new passion and form themselves as an artist just right in front of your eyes, you know? And so, you know, and she had Alzheimer's later on, but she still, you know, like seven books later, it's like, well, no, I have to work <laughs> on this. And so we worked on it together because she really wanted to put it out. It was important. It was like, I am this person and I need to do this. And so that was an, an, an amazing mentor because it it's like so many layers of, of, of mentorship going on there. Uh, and very supportive, you know, gave me a guitar when I was 12. I didn't ask for one and I didn't even know I wanted one. And then I got one and then look what happened. I mean, it was like, you know, so, but I mean, who were, and they tend to be, you know, a range of people who've, you know, influenced me or helped me along the way. And they've been a lot of writers, I would say, but I mean, I have the last song on my new CD is um, dedicated in part, I don't say much, uh, but it's dedicated to Joni Mitchell. And because Joni Mitchell was just sort of this, I is, you know, still this very iconic female singer songwriter who um, took, you know, it wasn't everybody, she'll, she's mad that someone thinks that she's a memoirist kind of songwriter and she's, that she is not. She says, you know, the art is what brings the feeling, you know, and growing up, uh, she was this incredible role model and mentor for how you can do it any way you want and, and, um, and continue um, morphing as you go and growing as you go. And for someone like me, who I'm very eclectic, <laughs> and so I've done all kinds, I mean, I started kind of on the, you know, sort of uh, musically in the folk thing and then I hop that to the jazz thing and then I hop that to the world music thing and then I hop that you know back to singer songwriter stuff and and I think that the the main people that I have been influenced by or mentored by were the people who gave me permission to do it any way I wanted to if it seemed like it was honest and there was truth in it and it mattered and um, so I have a long I you know, a long list and I'm just sort of spacing. I'm looking at, I have a whole wall of writers here and it's just endless amount of people I could list, but, um, and I can email it to anybody if I know what it is, but it is, you know, um, it never ends. And I'm constantly inspired by people, you know, and younger generations of incredible writers and musicians coming up um, always, blown away and I share them with my students because I think there's always so much what I learned from my mother is that you're constantly learning and I'm constantly learning I'm not done I'll never stop that so I don't know if that answered your question at all but it did thank you I just um I really appreciated your um 
your just drawing so much that and the the names that you've mentioned drawing so much on the past um but also um your your creative direction um and how it's changed and and i love that sentiment of of the having the permission to to go in the direction that that you're drawn to is really wonderful yeah. thanks we did have one other question um, in the um, in the Q and A um, about any connections for Finland's eastern and western cultures, and I don't know if you um, if you have any um, if that sparks um, any ideas um, in you, but um, uh, but it did come through, and I wanted to talk. Yeah, I'm not to you. sure what they mean by that. Nor am I. If if um, if we can get some clarification on the question, <laughs> I reach. I'm back. very fascinated with all of you know regionally, the certainly the music of Finland and um, and the, all the different cultures within it. I, I'm very moved by them and um, inspired by them. But I'm not sure if that's. I'm not sure what they're referring to. I think we've we've um, we've had a number of of um, just uh, comments about how your reflections have resonated with people and their family stories and the links they have to um, to their to their ancestors and I think this is there are so many. Um, so many family stories that that are mirrored in yours and in your music and your art and uh, and that is coming through in the comments, I think. Oh, right, because you know when you're doing this you're just it's kind of a crapshoot and you're just shooting stuff out in the universe and you never think it's going to hit any targets at all <laughs> ever and then when you I mean I feel as a. You know, I'm an American, and um, and then I've had the gall really to sit there and and record all this <laughs> music and finish. And you know, and I'm sure that everyone wants to sit me down and go, no, that's not quite it. But um, but at the same time, I hope they, you know, the reason I do it, it's a very emotional thing. It comes from deep inside. It's uh, I take it, I do it with a lot of hopefully it's appears anyway a lot of reverence um because it is very important to me so um it's a i'm glad that i'm not hit, missing marks <laughs> when, whatever i'm trying to do that some somebody's can kind of you know recognize something or experience something i'm great i'm very grateful for that Well, um, we've got a few minutes left. If anyone has any um, final questions um, for Diane Yavi as we're as we're wrapping up here, um, uh, but I did want to wish you congratulations on this this new album. And are you are you working towards anything new in this uh, in the wake of that that yeah. release? Yeah, it's um, I'm working on a novel. And is fin is Finland in it? Yes, <laughs> I cannot escape this, you guys. It just <laughs> walks around with me, whatever I'm trying to do. So I mean, I'm in early drafts of it, and who knows if anyone will ever see it. But that there is a novel, and it takes place in the U.S., but it also goes uh, also goes to Finland in it as well. And I've had a, I think I've had the most fun of all these projects. I have to say. <laughs> In writing it just because it's different it's a different genre for me and i've just had a blast so even if you know i'm the only one who ever sees it i'm totally satisfied <laughs> with that and then i'm working on um a couple uh poetry manuscripts so um you know whenever those show up in the world if they ever do that they're they're being worked on too 
That's great. We do have we do have one more uh, question that came in here asking about um, different influences in your work, specifically uh, if there's any kind of um, Baltic influence, not just Finnish, but Baltic in, in general influence in your work. Oh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I resonate to all the Baltic countries and those cultures and I mean, I love Estonian music and I love Latvian music actually. And um, it's, you know, and I, I love music from Russia. I, I, I mean, I love all of the, well, you know, with the, if playing the cantala, you know, you, cause there's that instrument is kind of all around the Baltic as well. And there's versions of it. So all of those countries have uh, impacted me musically just because well here's here are other voices and this is what they sound like here even though it's it's not the same as finland but there's there's essences that they share and then there's definitely there's definitely things that are that stand alone from those cultures and so um i love all of that i love all the baltic music um it's all been um I'm trying to think of how I, I what's the word I'm looking for it, it has a it's another tapestry to the culture because it is you know I find that I resonate to those those cultures in so many ways and well obviously with Estonian because it's you know linguistically it's there's some so many similarities and um, but it's um, I just feel like it's a bigger part of of my family, <laughs> maybe I'm being you know too bold there, but it it uh, it lives for me that way. Those places and those cultures, as does Sweden actually. So great, thank you. Um, we have we have one question here, one remaining question, and it's a it's a tricky one. Uh oh. Do you think we have time for a Cantalé song? If oh yeah, have... I was gonna do one. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have one for Let's do you. It. It's actually, a, I'm singing and playing. Is that, is that allowed? Are I you, think are... that sounds amazing. <laughs> so um, my mother was, and I am actually from things that I've been, had translated for me, uh, a, a very great admirer of Arvo Turtiainen, he's a Finnish poet. And he wrote this beautiful poem called Minakaisten. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, it's called sorry, Minakuulin Naisten Laulavan, which means I heard women singing. And um, my mother had translated it in her last book when she had Alzheimer's. And it's such a, it's just one of those really moving <clears throat> uh, poems that says, you know, I heard women singing countless numbers of women's voices, each in her own way. Old women sang to their sons and young women sang of their own strength. The early morning was in their voices, the rising sun and their words. And I realized that my own life was being sung in their voices and they were singing for everyone. I heard women singing. I don't know if you'll be able to hear, hear this or not. Minä kuulin naisten laulavan, lukaimat toimien naisenien, jokaisen omalla tavallaan. Minä kuulin naisten laulavan, minä kuulin naisten laulavan, jokaisen omalla tavallaan. Vanhat naiset lauloivat pojilleen, nuoret naiset lauloivat Minä kuulin naisten laulavan, kuin aamu oli heidän tännensä, kuin nousevä aurinkosana. Minä kuulin naisten laulavan, minä kuulin naisten laulavan, ja tajusin itse elämään laulevan heidän suullaan. Minä kuulin naisten laulavan. Ja 
ljusen är den itsen i kaffe fräck till alla olivan en av golden nice den laulavan en av golden nice den laulavan en av golden nice den Thank you so much for indulging us <laughs> with one more tune. I think you've all been indulging me. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, to you, Anna and Marcus. Really, really, this is really wonderful. To Jim Leary, I love you. <laughs> to everybody and for FinFest, because this is, again, like I said, I think this was my ninth FinFest experience. and. Um, I'm just feeling so grateful and fortunate that I was able to be a part of it and honored to be uh, included this year. Well, we were honored to have you. We really appreciate you um, and your work and, uh, and for taking the time to join us today. Um, uh, we are a little over time. I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in, for joining us, uh, for, for sharing your thoughts and comments and questions with us. And um, I'll just make a, a brief plug for our next um, event, which is in August, um, August 28th, um, same time, same place, as it were, um, with Eric uh, Peltonaimi. Um, uh, he is the next presenter in our music series. But for now, thank you so much to Diane Jarvey and, and to Marcus and, um, and FinFest USA for, for joining with us in this music series. Thanks everyone for joining and we wish you all a wonderful day. Talk to you. <laughs>